Every day in Syria, according to the latest UN figures, an average of 166 people are killed. The response from the international community? Another meeting. This one in Doha last weekend. Members of the Friends of Syria getting together to ponder a response they say can pave the way for a political settlement, not a military one, in the war between the ruling President Assad and Syrian fighters. We have said today very clearly we are going to step up in order to provide the capacity to the SMC and to the Syrian opposition to be able to directly address the situation on the ground. Now, that's as specific as I can be and as I intend to be here today. But what exactly will happen now? More arms, they promise, but what kind? Who will send them and who will get them? We're not told these details are swept under the rug of diplomacy. But what is clear the stability of the entire region is now increasingly tenuous. This is one of the participants at the meeting in Doha, the Foreign Minister of Jordan. His country is finding it hard to cope after hundreds of thousands of refugees have crossed from Syria. Patience is running short, reports circulating at the United Nations that many, many Palestinian refugees are turned away from Jordan, which already has a sizable Palestinian population. And there are rumors that there are training camps here for fighters going into Syria. After joint exercises with the Jordanians, the US is leaving behind military hardware. Is Jordan being readied for battle? All this and more as Jordan's foreign minister, Nasser Judah, talks to Al Jazeera. Nasser Judah, foreign minister of Jordan, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. You've just been part of a meeting of the so-called Friends of Syria group. Are you really the Friends of Syria? Because you keep on meeting and yet there seems to be little progress and the violence continues on the ground. By the latest Conservative UN estimate over the last year, an average of 166 people died every single day. Well, first of all, it's not the Friends of Syria. Uh, this is uh, the, the meeting of the London 11, and I'm not talking about a cricket team. Um, it is the a group of uh, um, uh, ministers uh, that began meeting um, uh, regularly, um, starting with uh, Rome uh, back in February, Istanbul in April, Amman uh, in May, and this is the fourth such meeting this year. And uh, it is um, um, five uh, Western countries, the United States, UK, France, Germany, and Italy, five Arab countries, um, uh, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, UAE, uh, Qatar, and, uh, and Egypt, and Turkey. So it's 11 countries. And the idea of, uh, and I think it's good that we meet uh, regularly, because every time we do meet, uh, we meet against the backdrop of certain developments on the ground, whether positive or negative. But they seem to all be negative. Well, unfortunately, the situation in Syria is negative, and uh, the developments that, uh, that we're seeing are all you know, alarming and, and of serious concern to all of us. But that also compels us to meet more regularly and to decide on certain courses of, uh, of action. If you remember, between the Istanbul uh, meeting of April um, this year and the Amman meeting of May uh, this year, there was a key development which, in my opinion and the opinion of many, is positive. And that is the, the, the Russian-American understanding that we um, convene an international conference, the sole purpose of which is to implement Geneva 1. And the operative line in Geneva 1 was the establishment of a transitional governing body with mutual consent and full transfer of executive authority. So if we are all in agreement that this is where we're heading, then we have to make sure that the ground is also reflective of that. Are you all in agreement that this is where you're heading, though? Because the host of this meeting, the Prime Minister of Qatar, said force and might might be necessary. The host of this meeting, um, Qatar, and all of us meeting here today, emphasized um, the parallel tracks, that the opposition has to be empowered and, and supported. But at the same time, the overall objective of all of us is to, uh, to go to, uh, to this international conference and ensure that uh, the political solution that we've all been seeking and talking about uh, for the last two and a half years is actually taking effect. How do you persuade the opposition to go to Geneva? I think they, uh, they're already persuaded. Um, but they, uh, and I think it's important to, to take into consideration that the ultimate objective of Geneva 2 is the implementation of Geneva 1, nothing else. 
Okay. And I think after the G8 meeting in Northern Ireland, which you attended, uh, you, you, you will see that uh, um, everybody was on board, including the Russians. So let me follow this through. The objective of Geneva 1, which you hope to achieve at Geneva 2, is a transitional government. A transitional can governing body with mutual consent and full transfer of executive power. And can Assad, Very play, important. Yes. Can Assad play a role in that? Assad is definitely going to play a role in the negotiations that lead to the establishment no, of the transition. No, can he be part of that transitional I think if you executive? Read, if you read the, the, the statement that came out of the meeting today, he certainly cannot. The regime cannot. I mean, the idea is that the regime is part of the um, negotiations to establish the transitional governing body, but the agreement, the consensual agreement of everybody today is that this is where it ends. And why would he want to negotiate his own demise? It's not a question of demise. I think it's a question of, um, and, and certainly we've been, well, I'm not in a position here to say you know, when he should leave or who. I'm just saying that there's a process that everybody has, has agreed on, and that process is a political uh, solution that will end the bloodshed and the violence and the destruction of Syria. That's the ultimate objective. I'm sure that he has that in mind as well, I hope. Okay, let's go further then. You get to that transitional government. That then leads to elections you then get a government in Syria. Isn't that the possibility, though, that someone will win the elections and you're still going to be fighting some of the extremists on the ground? Let, let's not preempt ourselves here. I think uh, there's, there's continuing bloodshed, violence. There are foreign combatants on Syrian soil. Uh, there's a, a serious uh, uh, threat of extremism um, coming out of the conflict in, in Syria, a Sunni Shiite divide, uh, further instability in the entire uh, region. All of this has to end, and the only way that it can end is through a political solution, a negotiated settlement. This is why, again, you have to remember that establishing the transitional governing body with mutual consent and full transfer of executive authority is the consensual decision of all of us gathered here today, that it will solve the problem. The point I'm trying to get at, is that transitional government necessarily going to end all this? Do you really think it can end all the violence? Or could we see a transitional, count, uh, transitional government, then more fighting, then more division, possibly Syria splintering, parts of Syria becoming jihadist states? Well, if you look at the, the, the ground and the mosaic of Syria today, you have people on this side of the divide, people on that side of the divide, and people sitting on the fence. And I think, um, I think the end result, when you see this transitional governing body, the idea is that it reflects the will and aspirations of the Syrian uh, people. So if it does, and if it is truly representative, then one would hope that the violence would end, and um, uh, there would be uh, a preventing of, um, um, of uh, foreign combatants continuing to pursue their um, agendas or their country, their respective countries' agendas on Syrian soil. How worried are you about those foreign fighters destabilizing your own country? We are in Jordan, we are different. We don't have this um, uh, ethnic and sectarian complexity that we see in neighboring uh, countries. I think the only um, instability uh, that we are worried about in, uh, in Jordan is this continuing um, influx of tens of thousands of refugees. Um, uh, today we have 545,000 Syrian refugees on Jordanian soil, 10% of our population. If the current numbers continue, we're going to end up with 20% by the end of this year. The demographics are alarming. I mean, this is, no country can afford to have uh, 20 or 30% of its population in the form of refugees. So that's I, the I'll only, back, that's the only thing we're worried about. But I think in, in so far as other neighboring countries, the ethnic and sectarian composition of these respective countries is, is what's worrying us all. I, I'll come back to the refugees in a moment, but I do want to stick on that point of the instability in Jordan, because I've spoken to military leaders from a number of different NATO countries who say their worst case scenario is instability in Jordan and the possible overthrow of your government and King Abdullah. Well, I mean, that's hogwash, um, because, uh, because uh, at the end of the day, like I said, Jordan is fully in um, uh, control of, um, uh, of its own uh, uh, territory. Like I said, the additional uh, 10 or 20 or possibly 30 percent uh, uh, increase in the, in the population by the middle of next year is a destabilizing factor in terms of the demographics, in terms of our economy, uh, which, is, which is already challenged. But when you have key sectors in the, uh, in the economy like uh, water, energy, education, health, and job opportunities, all affected by this mass influx of Syrian refugees, it's a cause for alarm and concern. But political um, uh, stability being threatened in Jordan, I mean, I think uh, y you know better. Why do you need, then, those F-16s and Patriot missiles that have been left over after the U.S. exercise? Patriots are a defensive uh, uh, weapon, anti-missile. Um, and, and please don't tell me that Turkey, with all, with all its um, uh, might and, uh, and being a member of NATO, um, uh, should also uh, have not uh, deployed patri Patriots. Uh, there are scuds and other uh, ballistic missiles being 
uh, used in the Syrian uh, theater, and we have every right to protect um, um, our, our airspace. We don't have any other means. So uh, I think it's, it's important, and we ask for these patriots to, uh, to come. That's in no way uh, reflective um, uh, of our uh, uh, concern for uh, political instability in Jordan. It's just to protect our airspace. I know you have to have lots of contingency plans. Is one of the contingency, contingency plans for those to be used as part of a no-fly zone? That is not on the cards. The, pa the patriots are a defensive weapon. Could there be a no-fly zone? Is it something that you I think this is something that the international community will have to uh, discuss, not individual countries. But what is Jordan's view on that? Do you think it's something down the line? If Geneva doesn't happen, you have to have some sort of plan. B. Again, that's you know hypothetical and preemptive, and I think that we work with like-minded countries. We don't um, uh, do things on our own. And yes, we are a country that neighbours Syria. We have a, a 380-kilometre border with uh, with Syria, uh, but uh, we work with with all our fr friends and colleagues and allies. So. Paint for us a picture of how bad it is in terms of the influx of refugees. The latest figure I saw in the neighbouring country was, countries was 1.7 million refugees now. This has gone up so much since three times, I think, tripled since the end of last year. That's right, um, in, in Jordan alone. And 1.7 million in neighbouring countries, I think, is an accurate figure. Um, in, um, in Jordan uh, today, we, we have, like I said, anywhere between 545 and 550,000. 145,000 of them are in camps. Uh, but over 400,000 are in Jordanian towns and, and, and villages and, and rural uh, centers um, and, and urban centers. And I think, um, like I said, water, energy, electricity in particular, um, and um, uh, education and health and job opportunities are all being seriously challenged. Um, and, and like I said, Syrians in Jordan, uh, and Jordan's history is, is full of receiving you know, wave after wave of, of refugees. And this is something that we do um, gladly on behalf of the international community. But we have really raised the alarm bell here and, and said the international community has to come and help Jordan. Otherwise, you know, Jordan will be forced to take other decisions. Right now, the borders are, um, are open and um, no country, I mean, if, if you're talking in US terms, 10% um, of your population is about 35 million people. Imagine having to cope with 35 million people uh, in a span of 18 months. Um, in, in UK um, terms, it's about eight, uh, 8 to 9 million people. No country can do that, especially a country with very, very limited natural resources. So an in, international community has to come in and help, uh, and help Jordan. Can you cope now, and how long will you be able to cope for if this continues at this rate? We're coping in terms of the practicality of letting the refugees in, but we're certainly not coping in terms of the impact on our economy. That's the point that I'm trying to make. In terms of those refugees, they say they have a really miserable life. Some of them feel that they're locked up in a prison in Jordan. Would you agree with that? Uh, I would agree that they're miserable. They're away from their um, uh, homes. Uh, they're not able to practice their livelihood. Um, a refugee camp is a refugee camp. Uh, regardless of, of the kind of facilities you, uh, you offer. But uh, if the connotation there is that they're locked up in a, uh, in, you know, if, if the connotation was that it's a prison camp, no, it's not, it's a refugee camp. Um, and it's, uh, the second refugee camp is better than the first, and the third is, the be is better than the second. But a refugee camp at the end of the day is a refugee camp. It's you must be concerned when you hear the reports of rioting, fighting, prostitution. My dear friend, the, ref the main refugee camp in, uh, in, in Jordan, al uh, camp, has a population of 145,000 people. A city? That's, that's the number four or five largest Jordanian city. And in a city of 150,000 pe people, you will get all sorts of uh, uh, crime and, um, in fact, organized crime uh, sometimes and all, all sorts of uh, criminal activity. We're trying to control that in coordination with the international um, uh, agencies. But let us not forget that it's a city of 145, 150,000 people. You've let in a lot of people. Everyone acknowledges that. But most of these are Syrians. What about the Palestinians who are trying to cross into Jordan? Many are being turned back. There aren't waves of Palestinians trying to cross um, um, into Jordan. Some have um, in the past when and, and were allowed in because they were coming from areas that were under you know, heavy bombardment, areas where there was military uh, activity. But these days, there, there aren't. If uh, the question is, um, at the end of you have to look at the numbers. You've got about 550,000 Syrian ref uh, Palestinian refugees in Syria. They are the responsibility of UNRWA in Syria. UNRWA has five different areas of operation, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, West Bank, and Gaza. And the, the Palestinian refugees in Syria are really the responsibility of UNRWA in, 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 in Syria. And we are talking to, to UNRWA. We get individual requests every now and then, but we have not really had waves of Palestinian refugees. And our policy on this is well known.
but because I, this will change the demographics um, of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict uh, rather than uh, the, 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 the Syria-related uh, aspect. But you have an obligation under international law to let in every refugee, don't you? Whether they're Palestinian or Syrian, and most of my time is spent where I'm based at UN headquarters. There, officials tell me you are turning away large numbers, thousands of Palestinians, and probably some of those you've turned away have then died in the conflict. Absolutely not true. We have not uh, turned away thousands of uh, Palestinians trying to cross. There are two kinds of refugees um, near our border. Well, I suppose this applies uh, everywhere. Uh, there are refugees who are, whose lives are at risk, um, whose lives are threatened, who are in areas where there's intensive military activity, who are being bombarded. They're going to run to the nearest border. And we've had those, believe me, <laughs> um, and continue to have them. And there are internally displaced uh, people within Syria. And you, know, you mentioned 1.7 million neighboring countries. I think the estimate now within Syria is probably about 5 or 6 million internally displaced. They are not necessarily in areas that are uh, uh, suffering military bombardment or intensive military activity, but desperately uh, short of uh, food, water, and medical attention. We're trying to help that, uh, that situation inside Syria. But no, we have not turned waves of thousands of Palestinian refugees. But you've turned you away some. And I ask you the difference between a Palestinian born in Syria fle fle fleeing the bombs and bullets and a Syrian fleeing I, exactly I the clear, same uh, conflict. I made a clear distinction between people fleeing bombs and bullets and between uh, people just seeking food, water, shelter, medical, medical attention. I mean, that we, we, we are fully cognizant of that fact. Okay, let me turn now to chemical weapons. We keep hearing about chemical weapons. We keep hearing claims from the Western countries. No one's actually presenting the evidence. You, as part of the inner circle, obviously see things that we don't see. Are you convinced by these reports of the use of chemical weapons? Am I convinced? Yes. I think the evidence is, is, is clear. Um, and now we have to um, wait and see if the United Nations inspection team will be um, allowed in. There was agreement over that in the, in the GA. See, the problem with chemical weapons, we're downwind. I mean, again, you know, when, when you're in the hot seat, it's, it's, it's different from, uh, from uh, um, looking at things when you're not. Um, there's four areas of potential danger when it comes to chemical and biological weapons. I mean, they can be used against your own population. They can be used against neighboring countries. Uh, they can fall into the wrong hands, meaning extremists and terrorists, and they can fall into extremely well-intentioned yet inexperienced hands, and that's also a concern. So we're keeping a very, very close watch um, and a close eye on this, and we've been doing so for uh, four months. And, and yes, I think we're part of the general consensus that there was limited use of, of chemical weapons, but use of chemical weapons just the same. The trouble with the UN inspection team is it's been set up to find out whether chemical weapons were used and not who they were used by. Even if they get there, we're not going to find no, out. No, I think you've seen, you've seen statements to the effect that these were from the US, from the UK, from France. Uh, it, it is now established that they, were, uh, that they were used. I think the UN inspection team will just follow that through. There isn't, though, an agreement between the Russians and the US on the scope of this investigation, so it's not gonna, ever going to happen, is there? But, well, I, I hope it does. I don't know if it's not going to happen, but there's certainly it's encouraging to see that the, that the Russians um, and the Americans are uh, on the same uh, sheet when it comes to that, and, and the, G, the G8 meeting was, was quite clear in that sense. Certainly, President Obama's red line has been crossed, and yet we don't seem to see the US stepping up its efforts in terms of arming the opposition. Would you like to see more done on that, re with re that regard? I can't presume to speak on behalf of the American administration, but I think you have seen uh, the statement of last week when the uh, American administration said very clearly that this red line has been crossed, and therefore it is stepping up uh, assistance to the opposition, including weapons. What is the plan B if there is no Geneva or Geneva fails? Because even if you get those two sides around the table, you have to accept it's going to be a very tough negotiation and it might not come off. I don't want to preempt things um, again. There's going to be another meeting of Russia, US, UN um, in Geneva to prepare the ground for, uh, for Geneva too. We, we can certainly get into uh, what if scenarios, what if it fails, what if it doesn't convene, uh, what if uh, the negotiations are complex. I mean, all of that uh, could be true, but right now, um, you've, got, you've got an agreement that this particular track, which is establishment of a transitional governing body based on Geneva 1 through an international conference in Geneva, another Geneva if you want, is, is what we should all be concentrating on. I think we have to, if, if you say that you are for a political solution, this is the way to do it. You talk about that track, but you're also secretly on another track, aren't you? We keep hearing about these secret training camps where you're training members of the opposition. I've heard it from Western military sources. I've heard it from opposition sources. Go on the record and tell us what the situation is. 
Go on, there I can tell you what exactly. In terms of these camps you've got in Jordan? You, uh, there are no training camps. Um, um, There's some training taking uh, place? As such, but I think what I, would, what I would say is look at the statement that came out of, um, of the London 11 uh, meeting here in Doha today. Uh, look at the statement, what it says. Continued support for the opposition. Each country, um, according to, to the way it sees fit. So um, I, I think that's where I leave it. And some uh, of that support but involves we don't, training. We don't in have these secret underground. No, but some of that support involves training taking place on Jordanian soil. Yes or no? Some of that involves a lot of things, not just on Jordanian soil. And some of it involves weapons being shipped through Jordan, from but the Saudis, from the Qataris, coming through, through Jordan and... I, again, re read the statement from today. It's saying very, very clearly, beefing up um, um, support for the opposition, logistical, military, and, and I think we all meet together. If I'm going to announce to you what we agree on, then you know, I, we, we shouldn't be doing discrete meetings. No, I understand that, but I just want to get your point, your view on this idea that Jordan is being used as a conduit for these weapons Jordan, that are going... Jordan is not being used. Jordan does what is best for Jordan. So, uh. so you support the <laughs> and idea. I think, and I think, and I think that be, being part of this meeting here is an indication of where we stand on this. So you support the idea of weapons being transferred through Jordan? That we are, is something we, are, we are supporting the idea of a political solution that will end the bloodshed on our border and the destruction and the violence and the threats to the stability of the region. You live in a very tough neighbourhood. You have Iraq, still big problems on one side of you. Their war may be over, but the violence continues. Tell us how you see the future of Syria over the next 10 years? Well, I mean, you asked the question, and I think I would answer it in a, in a different way. You started by saying that we live in a tough neighborhood. Uh, but, you know, look at what we have done in this uh, tough neighborhood. Look at the example that we present, presented of political stability, of democratization, of political, economic, and social reform led from the top, um, of um, uh, political stability in every sense. Um, and some people refer to Jordan as an oasis of stability. And long may it, uh, long, 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 long may it last. And we have... Um, an enlightened leadership that actually leads the reform process. So what do I see in Syria? Um, I, I see the prospects of, um, I see destruction on the ground today. Um, I see violence, I see bloodshed. I see the threats of uh, the fragmentation of Syria into um, something that is very, very un unpleasant for the entire region. And, and I see some of us trying to um, get a politi political solution going so we can end this. And I think that's where we should be heading, all of us. You present a grim scenario when you talk about fragmentation. What would that mean for the region? How could it affect the map of the region? Syria, uh, in terms of uh, the um, ethnic and, and religious composition um, of its population, is similar to some countries in the region. Um, but the basic difference is that in Syria, you have six or seven minorities, each one of which uh, represents five, six, seven, or eight percent of the population. All put together, they're a substantial bloc. You have you have the Sunni majority, of course, but then you have Shiites, Alawites, Kurds, Tur Turkmen, Christians, Druze, um, and this is why when we say a political solution, all these uh, components of the Syrian society have to be represented, and all of them have to be given assurances and guarantees that they will be not only part of the shaping of the future of Syria, but part of Syria itself, and with with a, with a say on the ground as to how things are run. So I'm, you know, when I'm when we say transitional governing body, which will hopefully lead to a pluralistic, uh, democratic Syria in the, in the future, I hope that this TGB will be uh, a, a representative um, uh, TGB, um, as well uh, as uh, reflective of the will and aspirations and the hopes of the Syrian people. That's Is there a danger in all this? that the whole borders of the entire region could be withdrawn, redrawn by There's us. never a shortage of danger in the Middle East. Um, and and, and you know, this is where we, like you said, it's a tough neighborhood. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, what we, need, uh, what we need to see is to have this bloodshed end. Do you believe that Syria is going to need international help for many years? Do you think the new Syria will need, for example, a UN force there, blue helmets in place? I don't want to get into the, um, uh, the, the mechanics and the logistics of it, but certainly, assuming, God willing, that the bloodshed and the destruction and the violence ends tomorrow, there's major reconstruction that is needed. Um, major. I mean, if you see the, the cities that have been destroyed, the, the, the towns that have been leveled, uh, the, the level of death and, um, and uh, general uh, violence, there's a lot of work that's going to be needed uh, post-crisis. And I think all of us um, in the international community, particularly the neighboring countries, will have a role to play in that. So UN force might be needed, a peacekeeping well, force, because there are some in the opposition who might not be happy under a transitional government. They might not be happy with elections. What about all those foreign fighters still the out there? The transitional governing um, uh, body is a, is a transitional governing body. It's not the permanent 
uh, government or governmental uh, structure, and one would, he one would hope that this will lead, pave the way towards um, elections that will have a permanent government for, for Syria. Now, assuming the violence ends and the, the causes of the conflict end, I don't see a need for uh, international military presence to preserve the peace. Uh, because the combatants would have ended um, uh, the, the, the crisis. But again, I'm preempting myself, and I think for now what, what we really need to concentrate on is the, the dignity of the Syrian people and the need to restore that dignity. Nasser Judah, Foreign Minister of Jordan, thank you very much. Thank you very much.